Hello folks and welcome to our service of worship for this uh, this coming Sunday for Sunday May the 17th. It is the sixth Sunday in the liturgical season of Easter. You're all very welcome to uh, to this service of worship from Kingston Road United Church. Whenever you are watching this, whether it's before our uh, regular time at 1030 on Sunday or sometime after after that we hope you will uh, enjoy what we have put together for you and once again I want to acknowledge a whole team of people that have helped put this together um, Karen Brown for her song leadership and uh, preparing the video for our opening hymn to Eric for the pieces that he sent in and also, of course, for his ongoing music leadership during this time. Uh, to the choir, this is the first time you're going to hear uh, many members of the choir singing um, an anthem and Jim Sanderson has, um, has helped to put that all together. He has put that all together with audio and, uh, and uh, video and also the last hymn. Um, so we're grateful again to uh, to Jim's contribution to Barbara Whitney for her gift of a solo this week and to Alana for sending in a time for all ages and also Darla Cameron is uh, is reading the scripture this week so um, it's been a real team effort once again and I want to say thanks to everybody we hope you can join us this coming Sunday at 10:40 or I'm sorry 11:45 for our Zoom friendship time the uh, the details of that went out in an email and so you can just check your email or uh, send me an email if you would like if you didn't get that invitation it's a time of informal check-in and conversation and uh, we hope you can join us then as we always do we begin our worship service with the acknowledgement of the land Toronto was in the dish with one spoon territory the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace and friendship and respect. And so we pause now just for a moment of silence just to remember that, to honor the sacred ground on which we stand and worship and we pray that we too will live with peace and friendship and respect with the earth. We light this candle as a symbol of the light of Christ that is within each of us and in the world. Let us pray. Loving God, Easter is a season of new life and so we give thanks for our new life in Christ Jesus. Bring us once again into your presence through your indwelling spirit that comforts and sustains us throughout our lives. May we find the quiet center of your love today as we renew our love through our worship together. Amen. Our opening hymn is More Voices number 30. It's a song of praise to the maker and uh, Karen Brown will be offering the song leadership and has prepared the video and the words are on the screen. It's a song of praise to the maker.
everyone and welcome to All Ages Time at Kingston Road United Church this Sunday morning or whenever you're watching this video. So this week we're talking about love and I'm just going to read a story here from our Spark Story Bible uh, about what Paul says about love. Love is Paul's friends in Corinth had lots of good ideas, but sometimes they forgot what was most important, love. Paul wanted to help them remember. Paul said, if I use words that everyone understands, but don't have love, I'm just clanging a bell or booming or a booming drum making noise. If I teach people about God, know what will happen tomorrow, know everything there is to know, and can figure out the mysteries of the world, but I don't know about love, none of the other things I know matters. If I sell everything I have and give the money to the poor, but don't have love, I have nothing, nothing at all. So then Paul writes about love. Love is easygoing and kind. It never wants what it can't have. It doesn't brag. It's not rude. It's not selfish. It doesn't get angry. It always forgives. Love is happy with the truth. Love always protects, trusts, and hopes. Love doesn't give up. It never fails. All the things we know and all the things we have will go away someday. But God's love will never go away. Every day that we grow older, we learn more and more. Today, we only know a tiny little bit about God's love. But someday, we'll know all there is to know about it. Paul ended his letter by telling the people in Corinth that love is the most important thing they have. Paul said, until the time you know everything about God's love, you have three things to remember, faith, hope, and love. The most important of these three things is love. You can see it's a picture, picture of a letter here. The question at the bottom of this story is one that I will ask you to ponder, to think about, to reflect on, as I'm sure Martha will continue reflecting on this, this scripture and this passage about love. How do you know you are loved by others? What does it feel like? And why is love so important? So remember this week to show love to each other and that looks differently when we're not able to be in the presence of others physically, but we can be creative about how we show love virtually as well. We
1 Corinthians 13 is deservedly one of the most well-known passages in the New Testament. This beautiful and evocative reflection on love represents the Apostle Paul at the very height of his rhetorical power. Today, we are most likely to encounter these familiar words in the context of a wedding service. However, the context of this passage is not Christian marriage, rather the Church as the body of Christ in the world. Read in this context, love becomes more than a feeling. It's action-driven and grounds and energizes the ethical life and political witness of the church itself. Here is the reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1-13 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end, and as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. Thanks be to God. So, hands up, all who have heard the passage from 1 Corinthians read at a wedding. Well, I know we're not on a Zoom call where we can either physically show and see each other's hands or raise our blue hands by clicking on an icon as I did in a three-day, very large Zoom meeting this week. But I am imagining that many of you might have raised your hands or at least thought about raising your hands. I certainly have heard this passage read many times at a wedding. I have read it at many weddings. I've preached on this passage at weddings. It's a beautiful piece of poetry and it's absolutely appropriate for it to be read at a wedding. But we need to remember that the original intent of Paul's letter to the Corinthians as we heard in the introduction to the reading, and also last week, that the passage is more about action than feeling, that the early church community in the diverse city of Corinth was in conflict. We hear in the previous chapter that Paul is writing to a community that is fighting about whose spiritual gifts are more important. Chapter 13 is a part of a section that is seeking to teach about gifts given to us by one God who cares deeply about humankind, who seeks relationship, 
and who wants humanity to use the gifts given to them to live in right relationship with each other. Professor of New Testament Brian Peterson says in his commentary on this passage, the Corinthians were actively pursuing some of the things that Paul mentions in the opening verses of chapter 13, such as speaking in tongues and knowing mysteries. There may be nothing wrong with such things in and of themselves, but if in the process people forget about loving their brothers and sisters, such things end up being worthless. Without love, it does not matter what budgets, buildings, or missional strategies we have. Such things do not give the church the shape that God desires. We may pursue various forms of spirituality or proper doctrine or activism in the name of justice. However, in the pursuit of these otherwise fine things, we must not forget that the church is called to be a community that practices love. Paul never says that such love feels good. And this is where the typical use of this chapter goes off the rails. Such misunderstanding creates trouble not only for expectations regarding the day-to-day -day realities of marriage, but also for the realities of the church. Because of our disordered assumptions about what love actually is, we often act as though the mission of the church is to gather like-minded and likable people together. We think that in such a community, it will be easy for us to love or, more honestly, to be, to feel the love. But true love is not measured by how good it makes us feel. In the context of 1 Corinthians, it would be better to say that the measure of love is its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. I told you last week that I would be attending a Zoom meeting this week of the governing board of the Canadian Council of Churches. And I also spoke about the decision-making process, that they practice consensus decision-making most of the time. There are some decisions that they have to put to a vote. And this was the case with one of the decisions we were asked to make this week. The issue was around admitting a new member to the council and their is an application process for this and a lot of time given for presentation to the council by the body that is seeking admission and time for questions and consultation with each denomination outside of the meeting. And so all of that happened at last November's meeting and when the group's application was put to the vote this week there were still questions asked reservations expressed, and one church expressed that if this group was admitted, it was possible that the church he represented would not be able to stay. Conflict, anxiety, squirminess, all this was happening virtually over Zoom. The two representatives from the applying church responded with much grace suggesting that they would resend the presentation that they made to the November meeting, which in fact answered a lot of the questions that had been raised that day. They were completely calm and extremely generous in their expression of understanding. And so the decision was put on hold until the November meeting. And my United Church colleagues and I debriefed the experience by email afterwards. Didn't we go through all this last November, I asked? Well, yes, was the general feeling. I later heard that other members of the council um, expressed apologies to the group in question and also that the people, that perhaps there might have been a better way to prepare for the vote. Of course, there are basic standards and agreements that groups must make, but it was our opinion amongst my own colleagues that this group had met those. In our private United Church reflection, we observed that if you started to pick apart the doctrine and practices of the member churches of the council, many would find much to disagree with, with other council members. But the refrain has always been, find what we can do together, not what divides us. And that's the starting point. Besides, one of my colleagues said, isn't it better to stay in conversation with folks that we disagree with than to not be in conversation at all. And by staying in the conversation, relationships are built, hearts are opened, wisdom is present, 
and the spirit often prevails in surprising ways. The leaders at Kingston Road United Church are starting to talk about how the church will reopen as restrictions begin to ease over the next few weeks and months. It will be very slow and very gradual. The National Office of the United Church has offered some guidelines on how this might start to happen and also very much stresses that we will be taking our cues from government and health officials. But I read this week that the reopening of the church is going to be much harder than the closing was. And I think that's going to be true. Just watching some of the disagreements play out to the south of us about how things should open up is enough to make my stomach queasy. The protests, the outrage, the mean-spiritedness, the entitlement, the violence in some cases. And I see it starting here in our own country. The individualism being expressed is shocking to me. This expression of concern for individual human rights and freedoms while ignoring the welfare of the most vulnerable among us and what is clearly most beneficial for the common good. How do we not let division and disagreement tear us apart? How do we make love, real, active, community-inspired love manifest in our communities, in our country, in the world? Again, artist and author and poet Jan Richardson puts into words things that I find difficult. In her reflection on this passage, she says, loving is always risky because we cannot enter into it without being changed, altered, transformed. In the face of this, we might well ask, do I really want this? Do we really desire to be undone? Loving is never just about opening our heart. It's about being willing to have our heart become larger as we make room for people and stories and experiences we never imagined holding. It's about being willing to have our heart become deeper as we move beyond the surface layers of our assumptions, prejudices, and habits in order to truly see and receive what and who is before us. It is about being willing to have our heart continually shattered and remade as we take in not only the brokenness of the world, but also the beauty of it, the astounding wonder that will not allow us to remain the same. And here is her poem, Blessing That Meets You in Love. It is true that every blessing begins with love. That whatever else it might say, love is always precisely its point. But it should be noted that this blessing has come today especially to tell you it is crazy about you. That it has been in love with you forever. That it has never not wanted to see your face, to go through this world in your company. This blessing thought it was high time it told you so, just to make sure you knew. If it has been shy in saying this, it has not been for any lack of wanting to. It's just that this blessing knows the risk of offering itself in a way that will so alter you. Not because it thinks you could stand some improving, but because this is simply where loving leads. This blessing knows how love undoes us, unhinges us, unhides us. It knows how loving can sometimes feel like dying. But today, this blessing has come to tell you the secret that sends it to your door, that it gives itself only to those willing to come alive, that it vows itself only to those ready to be born anew.
May it be so. Amen. Remember today in prayer those folks that uh, are held in prayer each week by the prayer circle. Barbara Livesey, Andrew Byrne, Sarah Condy, Karen Hager, Sean Harvey, Linda Blix, Owen Martin, Marjorie Blomfield. Let us pray. God of love, we gather our thoughts, our hopes, our dreams, our prayers, and we come to you to put into words the deepest longings of our hearts. We hear those words, faith, hope, and love, and we know that love is all, and if only we, they, everyone could love for love's sake, what a wonderful thing that would be. We bring our prayers in, in anticipation of what is not yet, but that we pray will one day come. We pray for our world, the events and situations which trouble us, cause us to ask questions. Take them and fill them with hope, we pray. We pray for our country Wisdom is sought, hope is needed. Help us to pray intentionally, to know the loving solutions, loving actions, loving responses to all that we are, all that we see. We pray for our community, the people who live and work where we live and work. Be with them and us, sowing seeds of love and hope in times of concern. And we pray for ourselves, for the things which frighten us or trouble us, for the uncertainties and worries we have. We pray that 
You may take them, heal them, fill us with hopeful love today and always. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his community, our creator, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May you be blessed with love as you move from this moment. Travel the road of life with love. We will journey the paths of God. Travel the road of life with faith. We will journey with the risen Christ and travel the road of life with hope. We will follow the Holy Spirit wherever it may lead. Amen. Our closing hymn is Voices United 333, Love Divine, and the words will be on the screen. Amen. <laughs>